We've been talking about the horrific tragedy at Robb Elementary School in Texas that left at least 19 children and two teachers dead. It's hard to even say that out loud. We also discussed what can possibly be done to help prevent this from happening again. Well, we are joined by Frank DeAngelis, the former principal of Columbine High School, where 12 students and one teacher were killed back in 1999. Frank, thank you so much for joining us today. I can't imagine what uh, you must be feeling. This must be triggering. Most definitely. And Take what goes through, that, that was my very first question actually is, when a school shooting happens, what goes through your mind immediately? Is it a flashback? Is it, talk to me about what, what goes All through All the mind. above. I knew something was happening yesterday because I start getting texts and mm -hmm. people saying, thinking of you, thoughts and prayers, and then within three minutes, uh, the media calls. And I know something's going on, whether it was school shootings or the situation in Boulder. Mm. And yesterday really hit me hard because it took me back to Sandy Hook. Uh, I was sitting in my office on that fateful day back in 2012, and all these reports came in. And originally they said, well, two kids, and then by the end of it, the numbers came in. And yesterday when I heard what happened, it just brought tears. I thought of my granddaughter. Right. And the first thing I want to do is go to her school here in Denver and just pick her up. And hug her. Yeah. Hug her. Yeah. You know, I'm, uh, sadly, only you would be able to answer this with the expertise that you probably can. What are the survivors of Uvalde going through right now, like today, just not even barely 24 hours after the incident? Probably denial. Uh, some anger, but denial. And I can remember uh, one of the toughest things I had to do in my career is the night uh, the tragedy informing those parents there's a good chance their loved ones oh, um, lost their lives. And that was some, uh, something that uh, I was ever prepared for. And so I think now, and one of the things that really got to me is they're getting DNA samples, I and I, I just can't imagine. And I, I truly believe last night, or when we heard those shootings, every parent just wanted to hug their kid because the question people say to me all the time when I go to these places, I can't believe it happened here. It happens other places, and that's what they're going through. We're all vulnerable, and it's got to stop because they're all of our kids. You know, you mentioned um, one of the toughest phone calls you had to make and just being charged with that responsibility, but you also were an integral part of helping your community heal. So how did you do that? My faith is very important to me, and um, for the first time in my life, I was questioning my faith. Wow. And um, I went down and I was part of the parish in, by Columbine High School in Littleton, and Father Ken Leone called me up on the altar and he said, Frank, you encountered the gunman, gun, gunman, you should have died that day, but God's got a plan. Now you need to go rebuild that community, not only rebuild that community, but help others. So I took that to heart. And then the other thing that was so important is um, there's a stigmatism that if you seek mental help, it's a sign of weakness. And if I can stress any point to those people in Texas, they need that help. Man, uh, man. I had a Vietnam veteran who called me within 24 hours and he said, Frank, you're being pulled in so many directions. Mm -hmm. If you don't help yourself, you're not going to be able to help others. Awesome. And I've been in counseling for 23 years and it's a sign of strength, not a sign of weakness. I'm so happy you said that. So many people need to hear that, right? Yeah. So thank you for that. Um, what advice would you give students, survivors, family members of the victims um, of Uvalde? Right now, everybody's in different places. And I think what I saw is you can go through the same event, but people deal with it differently. And we just got to respect where everyone is. And immediately people are at each other, but we need to come together. And, you know, I grew up in the 60s. I've never seen our country so divided. This has got to stop mm -hmm. because there are our kids and we can't, we keep making promises, but as adults, we're letting our kids down and we cannot do this any longer. Yeah. I don't know how to ask you this without sort of sounding stupid, but how did Columbine affect you personally? And obviously the phone calls and the trauma, but how has it lasted for you? Has it changed you permanently? Yeah, it, it has. Um, I was at Columbine for 20 years and I was a teacher, history teacher and a coach. And it affected me, a lot of survivor's guilt yeah. because those kids walked into my class or in my school at 7 a.m. and they never returned home. And Dave Sanders, who was a dear friend of mine, if he would have stayed in the cafeteria in the faculty lunch, I wouldn't be here. Because as a gunman was coming towards me, they spotted Dave and they stopped momentarily, which gave me time to get with the girls in the cafeteria. So a lot of guilt, a lot of survivor's guilt, but I made a promise. I couldn't go back to my house that night because the FBI was concerned about my safety and welfare, but I made a promise there's nothing I can do to bring back my 13, but I'm going to do everything in my power to speak on their behalf and make sure they didn't die in vain. And wow. So.
Bravo. You know, we're, we're 23 years past that tragedy. And I think my question to you is the day to day. How do you keep yourself from going to a dark place? Is that the therapy, the, the tools that you were given in therapy working for you every day? Because it's immediate now, but I think you more than anybody can speak to the long term effects of a trauma that yeah. there's no precedent for. Right, and I think, you know, I made a comment <clears throat> right after Columbine happened, I just joined a club in which no one wants to be a member. Mm -hmm. And one of the things is all of a sudden, things seem to be going extremely well, and I'll just use Columbine as an example, but we had a mother of one of our victim, or one of our kids that were critically injured committed suicide, so we were, went down this dark side again, and then in uh, February, we had two of our kids killed at the subway shop, and so every time we thought we were seeing some light, darkness would come upon us, and we would come, to, we'd had to come together and that's the thing is I tell people and when I'll meet with the people from Texas it's a marathon and not a sprint you're not going to wake up someday and everything's going to be back to normal but the thing they need to realize is there's so many people out there that want to help them that we could all identify and uh, we're going to be there to, for them. It feels like we are in the state of perpetual trauma hmm. and it's just to the degree in which it affects you it's a spectrum right because just last week on the show we reported on the mass shooting in buffalo and we've reported on so many shootings um both in the moment um you know the days after what do you think it's going to take to end what people are really calling an epidemic well what worries me, I never want us to get to the point of people saying, okay, how many this time? Mm -hmm. This isn't a way of our life. This is not the way it's supposed to be. We're not supposed to bury our kids. I am so blessed, my parents are still alive, but if they had to bury me, that would be tough. And I can't imagine what those parents are going through now, you know, in Texas. And we, we gotta just say, we gotta come together. And I, we see this all the time, and what's frustrating, I think back to all the rhetoric that was out there after Parkland, but we fast forward four years, we're doing the same darn mm -hmm. things. What lessons have been learned? And we need to come down and say, these are our kids, our most precious commodity, and we need to stand up and fight for them. It's, yeah. uh, and Sam, I don't want to interrupt, but it's just like, as he was talking, it just hit me. There was also the mass shooting at the Walmart in Texas, and there was a mass shooting at that church in Texas a couple of years, three or four years ago we were on stage, so, uh, on the show. So it's just, not only now are we covering mass shootings, we're covering them in just individual states. I mean, I... It, when people call it an epidemic, it's... It's, it's the public health definition. crisis. Yeah. I completely agree. Uh, you know, you mentioned that, you know, that we need to do more. Yes, we need to actually take action this time. And I pray to God, if we're going to say thoughts and prayers, I pray that for the first time on both sides of the aisle, we unite and we end this public health crisis. As a, in your opinion, as a former principal, what advice could you lend to other principals as far as mental health and if you see a student that is perhaps not acting, quote unquote, in a healthy way? You know, there were principals a lot smarter than me, but the thing that was so important to me was relationships. And I used to tell our teachers, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And it's about that and having that one good adult because they can make all the difference that they can turn to. And if they see a kid's in trouble, let us know. Because if someone knew that this kid, the shooter from Texas was in trouble, if they would have came forward, they could have got him the help and we wouldn't be having this discussion today. So it's about those relationships. Uh, I'm a strong proponent of school resource officers in the building and it's not, I think a lot of times it's the way it's betrayed. Well, we're putting the cop, and if you mess up, you're going, that's not it. They were part of our staff. They were a resource for our kids. Many of our kids can find it in the police, and it was so important. And I think it's all about those relationships. And people ask me all the time, what are you going to do? And I said, what are we going to do? We got to do this together, and, and that's the most important thing. A lot of people are writing in and saying they're just so angry. And I think that is f a lot of us in the studio all around. What do you do with the anger? Do you have the anger? Do you compartmentalize the anger? And this is just to our audience, and how did, how did you deal with that? Well, I was so angry, uh, and I think I mentioned I couldn't go home that night because the FBI was concerned about the safety and welfare of my family, and I was angry. What I witnessed, uh, just something you're never prepared for. And I was angry, but I had to turn that anger 
into where I could help. And, it, and I'm not an expert, but it's the five stages of grief. Yeah. You know, right now there's denial, and then there's going to be anger, and then bargaining compromise. But it's these tiny steps going there. And I think where people are worried right now is where are we going to be three months from now? It's it's a day by day thing, and that's where hopefully when I reach out to them, I can share that because that helped me greatly. I think so many times you're looking what's going to be like six months from now, eight months. Let's take you know a journey of a thousand miles starts with the single step. Wow, so. that's powerful. Frank, your story is, um, I wish you didn't have to share that story. I wish you didn't experience that story, but I'm grateful that you have um, at least done the work so you can help others. It's an honor that to takes, sit at the table. It is. No, honestly. Well, and takes, all you do means a lot in just opening this discussion and uh, it's fantastic. And you know, they're all of our kids. I know. I just, it's all of our kids. When I saw I'll, I'll never forget, there was an event right, right after Sandy Hook, and I think it was a mayor called me down to a civic center to just offer some hope for the people there, and he wanted me to read the names. Well, they failed to tell me that there was going to be eight by ten glossies of those little oh, kids, man. and I reached out and started looking down at those mm. kids, and it brought tears, and as I was sitting here waiting to come on, and I saw those poor little kids that it's they can't not, ever be. It's not okay. It's not fair. It's not right. No. no. We should be angry and we, sh we shouldn't put up with this anymore. Thank you again. I appreciate you. We appreciate you.